Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited uh, to uh, give a talk uh, in this uh, workshop. Uh, so uh, today I will talk about uh, how can learning from unlabeled videos help neural video synthesis. Uh, so this topic is quite different to the other talks. Uh, you won't see a lot of learning from unlabeled video. I'll first talk about why I think a neural video synthesis is an important problem and its application and what we have uh, be able to achieve uh, with label the data. And uh, at the end, I'll uh, suggest some direction that how unlabeled, uh, learning from unlabeled data can help uh, with this uh, neural video synthesis. So uh, first of all, what is video synthesis? Uh, I define it as a mechanism for converting an input signal to an output video. So you have a box, uh, the input can be many different things. Can be a random number. Uh, Carl has done work on this space using GAN to generate video. Uh, it can be other things, maybe like uh, music. Uh, anyway, the output is a video. And the phone uh, I spend most of my time on is uh, video to video synthesis or uh, bit to bit. Uh, so uh, the difference is that the input is not uh, arbitrary signal, it's an input video. And we expect the output to be a corresponding video. Uh, the correspondence uh, is defined by a uh, task. So it's not streets and different tasks can, can have a different definition of correspondence. Yeah, so there are many use cases uh, for bit to bit. Uh, I'm gonna play a behind the scene video uh, and uh, uh, to illustrate how, why uh, I think bit to bit is a, a very important part. So this is from a popular movie, Avenger, the end game. And you see that what the capture is in the uh, in the green, uh, in, you know, in a green with green carpet. Uh, but the final production is a beautiful images with all kind of visual effect. And yeah, so there's a lot of different characters, you know, cool move. But yeah, so what really happened is a bunch of guys uh, doing this kind of motion. And, and to achieve high quality results, uh, it's involved many artists and also rendering engine. Uh, and uh, yeah, to convert this uh, uh, raw footage to beautiful output. And this is the part I like the most. Uh, you, uh, I mean, there's really no monster there, just a green uh, ob uh, object. And uh, uh, the, the uh, production uh, team was able to convert this video to a beautiful uh, motion picture that we, uh, we saw uh, in the movie theater. Yeah, so I, I think, it, I mean, I will call it a video to video synthesis task. Uh, you have raw video footage and uh, you generate final production video. For this movie, uh, it takes 16 uh, visual uh, effect studios, uh, very well known uh, names uh, in the industry and the numerous design tools, Maya, 3D Max, Photoshop, and the many different rendering engines and the many, many artists work for many years to produce a beautiful result. This is great. Uh, this is what we saw uh, in the movie. Uh, however, I, I think we can agree that uh, this is not scalable. It's basically required army of artists to produce um, the result. And uh, uh, I mean, with uh, deep learning, uh, big data, we are looking for democratize uh, this creative power. And uh, I mean, this approach is not scalable. We hope that with a uh, neural network, uh, we can kind of democratize this and make everybody can uh, produce beautiful movies uh, using uh, this neural network tool. So you can look at, uh, you know, we want to enable people to use their video cameras, their cell phone, or utilizing videos from social network, from a uh, sharing platform, and with deep network to produce beautiful movies. And this is not just for movies. Uh, it can be used to uh, produce video games. I think in our childhood, we all designed some games and uh, as our friend to play with us. And uh, with the digital computer, we, design, we can de uh, design some game in the digital domain. Uh, but you know, not everybody is an artist. Uh, and then not everybody have the tool to produce beautiful uh, looking uh, video games. Uh, so now I'm gonna show an example, uh, trying to uh, illustrate how uh, this uh, 
uh, neural video synthesis can help with creating video game. So I'm gonna show you a video game called um, uh, Mar Marble uh, Madness. Uh, it's a very popular game in the 84, um, in the 80s, uh, produced by uh, Atari, and uh, it's commercially uh, very successful and profitable. So the video game is very simple. It's a very fun game. Uh, so Uh, marble ball rolling, and you control much the uh, the only thing so to the ball is the to get the ball. So this is the video game in 80s. Yeah, uh, so this year uh, in the media conference uh, called GDC, uh, so we are uh, a bunch of artists and the graphics engineer uh, has uh, remastered this game. Uh, I'll show you the video. Uh, I mean, it's the same game, but the visual quality is much better. Uh, So, uh, I mean, uh, with the advance in computer graphics, we can render these uh, very sophisticated movie production quality uh, footages in real time. But however, uh, lab footages still require a lot of effort to create the assets uh, for, for this uh, uh, demo. So it took uh, 15 artists work three months uh, straight to finish this demo. Um, so, you know, we start to think about uh, can we uh, kind of leverage learning, uh, you know, big data to help uh, to, to kind of uh, help remaster this uh, old video again uh, more efficiently, uh, most, in a most scalable way. For example, um, you know, uh, the mar marbles uh, is something that's uh, apparently there's uh, some competition for marbles and people do uh, create, you know, interesting track. And uh, we have here some kind of video in the internet. Here, this one. And we can uh, And you can see that uh, they are always uh, uh, real world 
uh, textures, uh, reflection, uh, specularity. Uh, can we learn the, all this stuff on videos, on label the video, and uh, help to remaster the video again? Or you create a new game and uh, you capture some video and uh, you are able to uh, improve the graphics of your game by using a uh, neural network. Yeah, so give a computer program, we render some kind of a very simple logic, but uh, fun uh, logic. And uh, use real world videos, uh, can we combine them and create something like a, uh, you have seen in this beautiful demo. And that's what uh, we are interested in, how uh, I think that uh, it's another good application of B2B, you know, uh, other than movie production, it can be used for creating video games, uh, basically democratize the video game production. Yeah, so uh, we have an early um, trial uh, and try to you know see if it is feasible. Uh, it was 2018. Uh, we published this paper in NeurIPS. Uh, so uh, it's called B2B synthesis. Uh, we have a demo where we have a steering wheel. Uh, we used to control a very simple graph engine to generate segmentation mask, and we use a deep network to convert it, it to a beautiful, uh, realistic images. And the, uh, you know have display. Uh, so uh, so pretty much uh, I mean this is the graph engine. Uh, it's Kala used for self driving car research. Uh, but we use it uh, to produce the segmentation mask. Uh, and uh, I mean this is the video uh, produced by the original Kala engine. It's you know it's cartoon like. Uh, but we are not using these uh, these images for uh, render the final output. What we use is the segmentation mask. You can see it's uh, kind of low quality, but uh, you can see that cars, road, tree, and building. And we know a conditional again uh, to convert a uh, sequence of segmentation mass to uh, photorealist images. And uh, then you, you can start to uh, drive in this virtual world. And uh, you know, although it's a simple graph, it's an input, but you have uh, uh, more realistic images uh, uh, in the output. Yeah, so we actually connected to a steering wheel. You see that the person... Uh, the friends the, that uh, you wheel. see is not rendered by a graphics engine. For training data, we are given some driving sequences of different cities. And then we use another segmentation network to extract the high-level semantics from these uh, sequences. We have the UE4 engine to generate this colorized high-level uh, layout. Different objects were given different colors. The network converts uh, this representation to images. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the above demo is uh, limited streaming. And you know, streaming is a popular environment uh, for video games, but it's uh, it's only one environment. There are many other environments, and so we hope that we have generalized uh, um, approach that can uh, be used to uh, kind of uh, produce many different video games. Uh, the core of this uh, of this technology is uh, image to image translation. Uh, so given an input image in one domain, uh, we search for a mapping, uh, we learn a mapping that can convert this input image to a corresponding image in a different domain. Uh, here it's summer to winter. Uh, this is a very popular topic. Uh, the popular world like a uh, picture based cycle again and many other papers are in this uh, framework. Uh, and many computer vision problems can be uh, casted in this framework. And there are two different settings. Uh, one is a supervised or paired or aligned or digital setting, uh, pretty much saying that the, you have an input-output uh, relationship uh, defined in the training data for you to learn. Uh, and another popular setting is the unsupervised or unpaired, unaligned, unregistered, where you don't have corresponding images. Uh, you, all you have are two sets of images, one from each domain that you are interested in translation uh, to translate between. Yeah, so uh, I'll quickly, uh, very quickly go over some of the works uh, we have done in this space. Uh, and then we'll come back to the uh, supervised setting where, uh, which we found is uh, kind of more relevant to uh, neural video synthesis. 
Yeah, so uh, it, this was in 2017, uh, where we tested if we can convert uh, like a daytime to nighttime, winter to summer, or sunny to raining. Uh, so here we know a uh, one-to-one -one mapping from one uh, sunny day image, you can only have one daytime image, uh, nighttime image. Uh, later on, we re realized this, um, this kind of one-to-one -one mapping is not sufficient to model uh, the correspondence between two domains. And we have a work called multimodal unsupervised image to image translation, uh, short, short hand unit. Uh, so here we show that uh, if you have a dog video, which is your input, uh, you can use it to synthesize uh, one cat. Uh, but it's not just one cat, you actually know a distribution of cats and then you can navigate in this space and create different uh, breeds of the cats and do the same uh, year motion. Yeah, and uh, then now we realize that uh, uh, the both approach still require uh, two big data sets in both domains uh, for learning mapping. And uh, there are many, many different domains in real world. I mean, so we start to think about, can we kind of generalize to unseen domain? And we have a work of units was published last year in the ICCV. Uh, so just quickly highlight the result. Below is what our model achieves. Upon seeing a new kind of animal for the first time, our model can translate images of known animals to the new kind in the test time. Upon seeing Chow Man for the first time, our model can translate images of other foods to Chow Man. Yeah, so uh, let's go to Funit. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Funit is uh, kind of addressing the, uh, the translation to unseen domain, but uh, it could still produce uh, images with uh, kind of many artifacts, the translation may not be feasible. Uh, recently, we uh, had a new work called Coco Funit. Uh, so it addressed the same question. Uh, you can think that uh, many uh, image translation framework has the following uh, architecture where you have a content encoder which get the contents, something that you want to keep uh, during the translation. Uh, in this case, it will be the pose of the tiger. And you trace style uh, from a style image uh, where it will be the uh, the color of the uh, the hairs of this husky, and you want to inject this style into the decoder together with the content to generate a uh, a husky in the post of this uh, tiger. So th this is pretty much the framework uh, using many uh, kind of popular uh, image translation methods. Um, so uh, in this Coco unit, uh, we realize that. Uh, there's one issue with the style encoder. So the style is extracted without knowledge of the content image. It doesn't know the pose of this tiger. It just purely extracts some style uh, from this uh, husky image. And we investigated um, you know, into this, uh, uh, this uh, setting and found that it creates some issues, uh, which called content leak problem. Um, the detail will be um, in the paper and which will be released soon. So in this code of units, uh, we suggest that uh, we should also use content image to produce the style code. And uh, this style code, we call it content condition the style code, uh, or COCO, and uh, then uh, to produce the output image. And with this, we were able to uh, kind of achieve future translation to more challenging setting, not just the animal faces, uh, you can do the full body now. Uh, you have a style and, and the style and the content, uh, where the content, post, and style can be very different. Uh, for Funit, it, it, it can create very strange results in this challenging setting because the style code is extracted without knowledge of the content. And in the Coco Funit, because we inject this uh, content in the style code computation process, we were able to do better. So this quickly summarizes our uh, journey in the unsupervised part, and I'll come back to the supervised part. Uh, so supervised part, pretty much, um, you know, the, the main uh, 
setting we work on is uh, convert segmentation mass to output image. Uh, for this particular setting, we also call it semantic image synthesis, uh, but it's just one form of image to image translation. Uh, so uh, the main, uh, you know, the um, framework behind this is conditional again. Uh, so we try to use uh, again to model the conditional distribution uh, where X is output, Y is your control signal. And when you do the sampling, you provide a control signal uh, and you can also have some kind of Z, which is, uh, you don't know what is that, but it just creates some kind of randomness in the output. And uh, for the semantic, uh, for the semantic image synthesis, which is segmentation mass conditional against, uh, for different uh, segmentation mass, you expect to output different uh, images, uh, respect the layout of the segmentation mass. And Z here will be something can be used to control the style uh, or you, you can think it's as the illumination of the scene because segmentation math doesn't really uh, describe the illumination of the scene. So we need another random variable to describe the illumination. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, semantic image synthesis. So uh, our first journey in this uh, direction is uh, P2P HD. Uh, so it was in two, CVPR 2018. Uh, so at time, our goal is to attend P2P to high resolution. So we achieve, uh, we successfully boost the resolution from 256 to 2K. Uh, and the key ingredient in P2B HD is uh, three, uh, three things. Uh, one is the cost to find generator. And second is a multi-scale discriminator. And the last one is a robust objective function. So uh, yeah, so this is uh, a cost to find multi-scale robust uh, objective function. So for the cost to find generator, what we do is uh, when we are given a high resolution uh, segmentation mask, uh, we first downsample it and then compute some kind of uh, low resolution um, output. Uh, but we still keep the high resolution one and to have another network to convert it to high resolution. Uh, by uh, leverage the low resolution feature, not the image of the feature, and uh, produce the output. Uh, this how we achieve to get resolution. And, and for this conditional again, the most important thing is to match the statistics of patches instead of full images. Uh, and uh, you know, patch deep in different scales. So what we uh, to leverage this uh, property, we uh, create image pyramid and have a dis different discriminator operate in different resolution uh, to help the network to learn uh, synthesize uh, details. And uh, we also uh, have a robust objective function uh, where we use the discriminator as the feature extractor uh, um, because we operate in this uh, paired setting, we have the uh, ground tools for a synthesized image. So you know, we try to measure the feature extracted by this uh, discriminator match for these two different uh, signals. And we do it the matching uh, across different uh, layers in this discriminator. And these are the three key ingredients that we achieve high resolution outputs. Uh, so we were happy with this framework for a while, but later we realized that uh, it doesn't scale to uh, more complex data scenes. Uh, I mean, you have uh, the, the CDs get images we use uh, in the P2B HD content about. Uh, 20 to 30 uh, labels of a real world, uh, they have many, many more classes. So when we directly apply the PhD to Coco dataset, which has uh, 182 labels, uh, it's kind of failed miserably. And uh, then we start to think about how we can solve this issue. Yeah, and, and uh, that, that's how we come out with the spade design. Uh, so in this spade paper, which published last year in uh, you know, CVPR, uh, the method is called spay, uh, but we also call the word Gaugen. Uh, so in, in, in this bait uh, method, we have two ingredients. Uh, one is the, the spay layer, the other is the style encoder. Um, for the spay layer, uh, so we pretty much uh, create a new residual block. Uh, you know, in residual block, a popular kind of residual block is uh, like activation first, uh, where you first have normalization, activation, and then convolution. Uh, usually, the uh, the normalization is a batch norm, and uh, we have something called spade uh, to replace batch norm. And with this residual uh, block, and we can build a generator 
uh, similar to uh, like a unconditional game, class conditional game, where you start from low resolution and gradually to high resolution. And this bay there is nothing but a, a batch node with a pixel adaptive modulation. We know that for batch node, uh, you first widen, uh, widening the uh, the data, and then you apply an R5 transform, and the, this R5 is usually uh, pixel independent, just the same value, uh, the same uh, parameter uh, for different image location. Uh, but when the input is a segmentation mass, it doesn't really make sense to have this uh, uh, the, this uh, fixed um, R5 transform for every pixels. Uh, so a natural thing to do is really to have a specially adaptive affine transformation. And this is pretty much what space doing. And now I will tell you why uh, this space is important to get uh, good results. So uh, we, we know that uh, training again can be very uh, kind of uh, uh, challenging. Uh, if uh, you have conversion issue and frequently uh, the more clasp. Uh, and, Batch node has been a useful uh, technique to uh, help with gain training. However, uh, in the context of semantic image synthesis, um, batch node has a huge issue, uh, like illustrated here. So, if you have a two segmentation mask, uh, let's say just uh, you know a segmentation mask with all the pixels labeled as sky, and another is with all the pixels labeled as grass. And then now you apply convolution, you apply batch node. It turns out that uh, after this batch node, everything is, you know, for different segmentation mask, they have the same output because, you know, the mean is subtracted and then you are now using uh, the, this uh, new uh, bias provided. And so you don't really see the inputs of uh, cement, cementing labels. So uh, th this meaning that, uh, uh, when you use batch you node know, in your framework or other, you know, it's also applied to instant node, uh, you are really counting on the correlation between semantic labels uh, to learn the outputs. For cityscape, it's fine because uh, the, the, all the scene will contain road, uh, sky, building, they have a diverse set of uh, semantic labels, but for general scene, uh, this is gonna be challenging. Um, so and, and so the, this is comparison uh, when, when you have a, when you use the PPHD trend on the uh, cocoa, uh, when you input sky and glass, uh, it does generate uh, the same output, but with spec it can differentiate these two different inputs because um, we actually provide the segmentation map information uh, through the modulation part of the batch norm. Yeah, so, and you might question that, uh, is this common to have uh, like a, the same, you know, a uniform label map uh, in the natural images? Uh, it's actually quite common, uh, for example, for these uh, beautiful images, uh, most of the region had the same label. Yeah, so it, it really hurt the uh, performance. And that's why we uh, use space to improve the uh, performance. And, and here I'm not going to talk about the, the other component of space with the style encoder part, but uh, it's basically provides some kind of illumination control. Yeah, and we uh, create an online demo, it's still running, and we have many people use it uh, till today. And uh, so, uh, so you have, feel free to uh, use it to generate some images, and people have. Uh, uh, use this interface to create some beautiful image and share in a social network. Uh, so, and you know, some people find a uh, peace when play with this uh, online demo. So, I uh, encourage you to try it to happen. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now let's go back to the video to video synthesis. Uh, above, uh, you know, the PWHD of Spade uh, are mostly uh, image models. Uh, so to handle uh, to output videos, uh, there are many other things that we need to uh, pay attention to. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, temporal consistent. Uh, so you don't want uh, output video uh, which is flickering; it doesn't resemble a real world video. Yeah. So in bit to bit, so we basically intend uh, the bit to bit framework to video generation. And there are several ingredients. Uh, one is a sequential generator, a multi-scale temporal discriminator, and a, a special temporal progressive training procedure. And here I'm just gonna talk about the sequential uh, generator. So what we do is uh, we have a sequence of segmentation mask um, and a 
some previous generated image. Uh, we use a generator to generate something called intermediate results. It, it can think it's a hallucination uh, for the current frame. And we also synthesize the flow map, uh, which would be the, um, the optical flow from the previous frame to the, to the current frame. And we use this flow map to warp the previous generated image and combine with this hallucination to produce a final image. So once this final image is produced, uh, we take it, you know, we have a new segmentation mass as input, and we take this uh, output as an input and synthesize the next frame. So this way, uh, it's pretty much an RN, um, uh, so one step RN, and, and, and uh, so we use this one to generate uh, temporally consistent outputs. And uh, other than this the seascape, it has other application here. We uh, input a face video, we check the edges and output uh, uh, the person uh, with a different style. And here we do the same, but uh, this time we make the face uh, um, kind of smaller. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, to produce the output. And we have also applied it to uh, motion transfer. Here we have an input video. We try the, uh, the post. Uh, uh, we actually use the combination of open post and dense post. And then we uh, have a model trend to convert the, uh, this uh, post to a different subject. Uh, and so uh, by using the, uh, the post extraction together with a V2V network, uh, we can achieve like a motion transfer. And here we need to train a model for this uh, uh, lady uh, on the right hand side. And for another type of, you know, for generate another lady, uh, we actually uh, train another B2B model for it. Yeah, so we are fortunate that our CEO like this research and then he helped us to create a model of him. Uh, and we were able to do the uh, motion trans uh, transfer uh, from Michael Jackson to, uh, to our CEO. Uh, and what we do is uh, we actually have a green screen catch up environment where we catch up in doing uh, different motion and train a model. Uh, we, it took about 20 minutes to finish the, uh, the capture and uh, for CEO 20 minutes is quite expensive. And this start to make help us realize the disadvantage of bit to bit. So we need a separate models for each person. And uh, you know, three people we have to have three models. And it, you know, to for output a new person, we need to create new data and uh, do training again. Yeah. So if you want to make a movie using B2B and you, know, you have hundred characters, and then you have to train hundred bit to bit, uh, quite expensive. Uh, and you, of course you have to collect data from these hundred different subjects. So we, does think, we start to think, can we have a one model for all? Uh, so you have one model that can generate different people. And uh, this model is configured dynamically in the runtime. So in the runtime, you have some kind of example image or a sample video from a subject and you are about to generate that person doing different motion. And a different subject, you have different, you know, the same model can generate motion uh, of this other person. Yeah. So uh, uh, then um, we kind of finalized the idea and published this paper in last year's New Rips. Uh, so it's um, improved the scalability of bit to bit. Uh, so it's a one model for many subjects and uh, use a hyper network to generate for the spade module. Uh, I will describe what do I mean. Uh, so when we have example image that the person we want to generate, uh, we first extract some features uh, from this subject. And uh, this feature are used to produce the uh, filter weight um, to be used in this uh, uh, semantic uh, encoding module. Well, the semantic encoding module pretty much converting the semantic input segmentation mass opposed to uh, real images. And we have a uh, transition to use spade uh, for this task. 
So uh, space is basically um, a neural network with uh, a convolutional neural network. And uh, so the convolution weight uh, in the original space was learned. Uh, the here is dynamically generated. So for different subjects, we have different uh, filter weights for the space module. And uh, then this uh, produced the, um, the, the affine transform uh, to modulate the uh, main branch. And this affine transform is specially varying because uh, it's spade. So different pixels have different affine value. Uh, and it's also uh, style dependent because the style is provided by the input Im image. So when you have different example image, you have different uh, filter weights. And then combine these two, we were able to uh, uh, synthesize this unseen person uh, to do some motion. Yeah, so this is how we achieve this uh, future art generation capability. So, uh, yeah, but. I think uh, we have made some progress, uh, but there are still uh, issues. First of all, um, the quality is still far from film quality. Uh, I think we will only start if we can achieve film quality. And the controllability is still far from professional tools. Uh, if you use uh, Photoshop or other uh, professional uh, editing tools, you know there are a lot of options that you can use. Right. And, and the amount, the, the, the kind of control we provide in this uh, uh, video synthesis model is still pretty limited. Uh, so definitely it's something that we need to improve. And other than this too, it also have a long-term consistency issue. Uh, for the V2V framework, uh, it's basically a sequential generation module. Uh, it uh, has no memory. Uh, so it doesn't know uh, uh, what it has, you know, it has visited, you know, for example, in, in a cityscape, right? You're driving in a, in a city, uh, you see a block uh, and you come back to this block, you expect the look should be identical, right? But for the B2B model, it doesn't really remember what it had generated, you know, it, it probably just remember that the previous friend. Uh, so, and then, because of this issue, it wouldn't be able to synthesize the image at the same, the same way it synthesized the first time. Yeah, so we identified the issue and, this, um, and then, um, you know, we have a new work to address this issue. And of course, there are many other issues. Uh, so still a long way to go. And uh, next, again, I just uh, quickly uh, show the video uh, on, on the new uh, work Co uh, world consistent bit to bit. So it's improved uh, uh, the long term consistency of bit to bit. Uh, so meaning that when it comes back to the same place, it will render an image that's uh, similar uh, to the first image it rendered. And uh, it's also produced uh, better images. Yeah, so. So I'm gonna play the video and you will see some video which are generated by our latest uh, bit to bit.
Yeah, so the teaching in this uh, world consistent uh, B2B is uh, we build a map of world while synthesizing uh, the video. So then it has uh, access to the, uh, the world that it has generated us so far. And that's how uh, we can use it to generate consistent uh, output. And uh, the paper will be in archive soon, so I uh, encourage you to read more details there. Yeah, so uh, now I'm gonna talk about uh, my view on how can learning from unlabeled videos help with video synthesis. And the work, uh, the works we present so far are all based on uh, some, some, some kind of uh, labeling. Uh, either we have segmentation mass or we have the human pose. And uh, uh, even with segmentation mask, uh, we still find it's very hard to synthesize uh, human in diverse pose. Uh, of course, I mean, if you only have faces, we can do quite well, you have seen style gain results. But here you have a diverse scene from Coco, you have a person holding a tennis racket, and the segmentation mask of the person is just uh, a black silhouette. And uh, this is the, uh, the best uh, semantic image synthesis when a uh, network can do now. Uh, it synthesizes the tennis rackets really well. And you, you, you can see the person, you can see eye, nose, but it really uh, doesn't look right. Uh, however, when you have a detailed segmentation, like uh, you know the eyes, your uh, eyebrow, uh, mouth, you can synthesize a very uh, convincing uh, human face. So, yeah, so, but to do that, you need a fine grain labels. Uh, of course, you, you can achieve fine grain labels for human faces, but to generate di diverse things, you need a fine grain labels for many uh, uh, different objects in the world. You probably need to differentiate uh, uh, mouse and uh, you know different kind of mouses, different kind of uh, you know parts of uh, animal, uh, or you know, when you have a just a segmentation mass of building, it's really hard to synthesize a good looking building. But if you also have the segmentation of the windows inside the building or rail, you can do a much better job. So we need to get fine grain labels, uh, but getting those fine grain labels is gonna be uh, very costly. So this is something I feel like, uh, if you can learn uh, these fine grain labels uh, from uh, unlabeled videos, uh, you will be very useful for semantic image synthesis. And this, this is about improving the quality of, of the uh, output video. Uh, for improving the controllability, you know, uh, in a movie or in a game, uh, we, it, you know, involve other uh, um, subjects other than people, right? I mean, for people, uh, we have very good post uh, recognition network or lemma uh, recognition network. We can synthesize these uh, subjects uh, really well. But I mean, to create a good story, you might want to have a bat, uh, crocodile, uh, ostrich, or some kind of strange uh, tree. And these things are hard to uh, animate uh, because uh, you, know, you really need person to annotate uh, these objects. Uh, so, yeah, something I think could be useful is can we learn some kind of correspondence uh, between uh, across different uh, object category uh, using unlabeled video. Uh, there's something I feel like it can improve the performance. So uh, yeah, so I believe there are many other ways unlabeled videos can uh, uh, help. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so happy to learn more from all of you. So uh, this pretty much concludes my talk, and uh, this is a lot of work, and I definitely didn't do it by my own. That's a lot of great co-workers, uh, co-authors. Um, yeah, so I should uh, thank you for all the support uh, during the years, and I think it's time to take questions. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, okay, there's a few a few questions in the chat. Um, uh, let's see, I'll go just in order. Um, so the first question is, um, why has the background uh, been also changed in Coco Funnet? Um, is there a way to limit the change only for an instance in the image? Uh, 
Yes, uh, so uh, if you have the object segmentation mask or through translation, you also learn some kind of mask. Uh, you would be able to limit the translation uh, to the object area. Uh, and uh, uh, I think there's a lot, another line of uh, research work uh, called uh, figure transfiguring. Yeah, so uh, those uh, papers would address uh, the issue there. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and then the second question is um, about the, about the long-term consistency results, which are quite cool, as 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 very cool. Um, the question is: uh, enforcing long-term consistency may lead to may lead to degenerate results. Um, what have you done to avoid this? Uh, I'm not sure what the questioner is asking. What, what type of de degenerate results? I guess um, I don't know if this person wants to clarify. So. Um, I, I think the uh, because we are building the the uh, the the wall map uh, as synthesizing the images, so we do in uh, use additional. Uh, we kind of have additional memory to remember what we have synthesized. Uh, it's actually uh, not hurting the performance. If you compare the V two V result and the work consistent V two V result, you see uh, improvement. Uh, so, um, you know, even when you use the spay module in B2B, you still see improvements uh, in the generated quality. So uh, we, did, we didn't see the, uh, the degeneration part. Hope this answers your question. So, okay, I, I have kind of a high level question. Um, do, what do, you th do you think learning is going to replace the entire uh, pipeline for graphics? Uh, let the dream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it's still a long way to go. Uh, so uh, I think there are two end of spectrum. Uh, for the movie production, uh, you cannot tolerate any artifacts. I don't know if you have watched the Life of Pi movies. Uh, it's pretty much in ocean. And uh, when producing that movie, they have a people manually to, to, uh, to, uh, to paint the water drops, uh, the, the splash to measure uh, that's a video that's convincing enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so that amount of quality they, they wish for. Uh, for to, to reach that quality, I believe it's still a very, very long way to go. But that's a, another end of spectrum. Like uh, you have seen many cool videos in social network. Uh, you can see Alibaba, but it's funny, you know. So uh, it, it still creates value, uh, you know, entertainment, uh, but it, it's the other. So what I see is uh, traditional graphics fun. Uh, one end here, and uh, we are coming from another end. So, and I mean, there are many graphic researchers try to employ neural network as part of their pipeline, maybe, you know, to uh, do the ray tracing more efficiently or creating texture more efficiently. And what we are trying to do is uh, to see how this data driven framework can, you know, can go. So maybe we'll miss somewhere, and I don't know. So, <laughs> with more compute and more data. Uh, I hope one day we can uh, achieve it. Uh, you know, human brain is very powerful. You know, you can imagine you are in many different scenario. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, so let's some hope it could be achieved. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks, th th thanks so much. That was a fantastic talk and, and awesome results. Um, so thank, th thanks so much for making 